Oh, good evening, everybody. How's everybody tonight? Hear me okay? Good stuff. Okay, we got, what, four, eight. Looks like there's 12 of us tonight. <clears throat> so uh, I guess we might as well get uh, get right into it. I know Al wants to talk a little bit about his uh, phaser rig tonight. And uh, Brian, uh, update with his QCX. So we'll, we'll go to those guys first. And then we can do our uh, we can do our round table, and uh, we can maybe mention as to what each of us has on our on our benches, projects we're working on, or as I mentioned earlier, maybe just noodling stage. You know, you got some kind of idea that you're that you're working through, and maybe you might want to mention it. And then, of course, any questions, et cetera, et cetera. So I guess we'll go to the top left of my screen. And uh, Al, good evening. How are you tonight? Fine, thanks. Uh, can everybody, hear me. Fine. Okay, good. So uh, this is the uh, phaser that I'm working on. I'm finished step five of six, except for testing. Um, and uh, it's a very nice uh, kit to build. Uh, two more toroids to go in uh, step six. Um, step five had a, uh, a twisted uh, pair toroid to wet to uh, wind and uh, I was mildly disappointed to see that they actually had twisted the wires together for me so I didn't even have to do that but anyway it was uh, it's been a very nice kit so far I'll just bring up my uh, receiver test uh, sorry do this in the proper order to share the screen. Okay. Actually, I bring, I'll bring this up first. And then I go to share screen, I guess. goodness <laughs> I did it last time Is everybody able to see that? Yeah, we've got it now. Al, go ahead. Yep. Okay. Okay, so this is the receiver test. <clears throat> and uh, the antenna was a uh, uh, homebrew NFED uh, lying on the floor of my loft upstairs. Totally unmatched. I just plugged it into the phaser and uh, plugged the uh, computer um, uh, audio input into the uh, phaser output. Now, the interesting one here is the last line. It says CQ from EA7HY in IM66. Now, IM66 is in, the, is in Spain, in the uh, southwestern part, Cadiz area, uh, west of um, Gibraltar. So you can see um, I'm getting a bunch of uh, U.S. calls. K's and N's and so on. But this is the most interesting one. Okay, so anyway, the so the receiver worked. Uh, as I said, a totally unmatched antenna. Um, just get out of that. And uh, the other thing I'll get into is The instructions. Somebody wanted to have a look at the um, schematic. 
So I'll go down to the schematic. For the trans transmitter part. So is everybody still seeing this on the screen? Yeah, we can still see it, Al. Okay. Yeah, yeah increasing your, uh, uh, the uh, view there is, is a good idea. So anyway, this is the uh, audio frequency in and the antenna out. And what's happening in the middle is uh, mysterious to me, but uh, presumably not to you guys. So I'll just leave it on the screen if anybody wants to uh, comment on it. I see our old friend, the FST3257 chip is in use there. And that's the chip we used in our, uh, when we did our Q4 project way back when, our first uh, venture into uh, SDR stuff. So the uh, instructions are available on the Midnight Design Solutions site and you can download them and uh, it contains a page on theory of operation which uh, you can read. And as I said, it's a very nice kit. It has six stages um, and after each stage there's a, a test they can perform. Um, and uh, the previous stage was the one where I tested the river and this one I have to test to prove that one of the sidebands is suppressed but I haven't done that yet uh, but then uh, tomorrow I'll finish the uh, kit itself and then it's into a uh, calibration and alignment and then presumably uh, attempting to make some contacts uh, what it like uh, FT8 uh, devices everywhere you have to have accurate time so that's one of the things you have to set up correctly Currently, Windows 10 has uh, more accurate time than previous versions of Windows, but I still am downloading and installing a, a, a time app to, uh, to make sure of that. So that's really all I have. Uh, if anybody wants me to leave this on the screen any longer, I will, but otherwise we can move on to the uh, next presenter. Any questions for anybody? Can I make a comment? Sure, go sure. ahead. It's uh, it's almost identical to the soft rock. That's exactly how they do it. Yeah, you're right, Ken. I noticed there with the amp, the op amps feeding into the FST and uh, chips there, and I thought, yeah, that looks very familiar. But it's been quite some time since I've looked at that circuit, really. So it was hard to make a direct comparison. But yeah, I believe you're right. Yeah, the uh, output. Is a single uh, transistor, but in the soft rock, they use a pair of BS 170s. What's the output, Al? Four watts. Okay, that's pretty good. That's pretty good. Yeah, that's uh, FT8 is uh, apparently four watts is, uh, I guess, almost QRO for FT8. But. Uh, yeah, it's uh, calibrated to FT8 too. You go through a calibration process to make sure you're not overdriving it. I'll be interested in seeing your results, Sal, when you get the get it on the air, transmitting stuff. Because I've been doing a fair bit. Of, I've been doing a lot more FT8 than I thought I ever would over the last few months. And I suspect there's an awful lot of people out there that are doing 100 watts and 50 watts and 75 watts. I think there's more people up on those power levels than there is down at five watts and less. Hmm. Have you used FT8 call? A little bit. And okay. uh, FT, uh, JS8 call, yeah, I've done that a little bit. And I've also done a little bit of, uh, oh, what's the other one? Uh, FT8, DXFT, I can't remember the name of it off the top of my head. Okay. So that's it for me, unless there's any anything else you want to see. <laughs> Oh, it's a really great. nice kit. It's a okay. really nice kit. I uh, recommend it to anybody. Another nice thing about 
uh, too, is it seems to be extremely popular. Uh, the designers are readily available on the chat with the designers groups IO. And there's a few, quite a few people seem to be doing a lot of modifications and en enhancements to the, to the rig. And uh, a couple of them, I think, are uh, not too far off from here. I think a couple of them are up in Ottawa. One for sure is up in the Ottawa area that's making, uh, I think I was mentioned it last time, uh, cat control for it. So anyway, interesting stuff. Thanks, Al. Any other, any other comments? Okay, Brian, how's the uh, QCX coming along with you? Well, it's coming along fine. So uh, I'll go through my voluminous notes here. So first of all, I just want to say, if anybody's interested, uh, uh, Neil Hecht, the guy who designed the AADA uh, LLC meter that some of us have, had some nice crystal design software, or sorry, filter design software. Uh, he is no longer with us, but his software is preserved. So if you're interested in filter design software of various types, you can just do a search on AADA -E, A -A -E software, and you'll find a couple of repositories for that. So you might find that interesting. Um, <clears throat> so on the uh, QCX front, uh, as uh, some may know, uh, I bought this uh, used kit, which was version three, uh, which now is up to version five on the board. So the one good thing about Hans is he, he keeps updating his firmware, uh, which I'll get to in a second. But the other thing he does is has done a lot of small hardware revisions, which uh, uh, for those who are interested in the improvements means they have to uh, take off parts, put them back, put new parts in. So I've pulled out the old parts that no, no longer used on this kit, and I'm waiting for the economy to open up again so I can uh, get the, the proper parts. So there was a few things. So he changed his uh, CW filter uh, from poly, sorry, from uh, electrolytic capacitors to some uh, ceramics, uh, taking that down from uh, um, 10 microfarads to one microfarad to get rid of a keying thump. Um, that still didn't get rid of it. A lot of people, the one suggestion had been to re to actually parallel another uh, capacitor uh, that was, I think, a uh, 10 microfarad parallel, 100 microfarad in the bottom, so you don't have to remove it. And that apparently does get rid of the thump. So that remains to be seen. I haven't been able to do that to my existing QEX already, let alone the uh, uh, the kit that I'm building. But when I get those parts, I'll be further along. So I'm just going on uh, without those parts. There's only a few, a couple of resistors and a few capacitors, and I'll get those. Um, so on the updates to the firmware, um, that's... Um, uh, it's an uh, AT Omega 328 chip, I believe, um, in the uh, in the QCX. And um, about three years ago, uh, you know, what, I think the kit came out in 2017. So not long afterwards, Hans has had some tutorials on how to update the firmware. And there's a number of ways of doing it. You can do it with a small EVR uh, programmer like uh, Tiny ISP and various other things, many of which seem to have become unavailable. But I did find one today that's available uh, through SparkFun, but I'm not gonna use that. Uh, there was another suggestion, which is much more up my alley, uh, which was basically you uh, use the Arduino and then you use the uh, AVR Dude S uh, software to basically drop the hex file down. So I'm gonna try it out on the weekend because um, basically I've been sort of reading the instructions and rereading the instructions and trying to really digest them because if you, do it wrong uh, and don't follow the instructions, you could end up erasing the EEPROM, which is not good, or you could reset the fuses on the uh, programmable chip, which again, you don't want to use, do. So I've read some more on that today, even on some instructions on not necessarily using the Arduino as the pathway rather than using the, uh, the, uh, the tiny ISP. And I seem to have fully digested that. So I'll give it a few more days and then get up my UNO, my Arduino UNO, and uh, the five little cables I need to connect between the, um, the programming posts on the uh, on the QCX. I have two chips, uh, one from my original one and one from the, uh, the kit that I bought that was an older version, uh, and they're both the same version. So I'll try to do one of them. I had a guy in BC who said he would do it for me uh, when I was a little bit more uh, um, scared about doing it myself. And then I went to the post office to find out what it was going to cost to send the chips to BC and back. And basically it would have been about 30 bucks to do the total both ways because it's not a letter package. And once you get some bulk in there to protect the chip, 
uh, was going to ship it in a uh, in a uh, Altoids can, but anyway, that's out the window. So as far as that goes, um, the one last other thing that sort of interested generally is uh, there was a transformer in the QCX, which basically has uh, about a well, depending on the band you're doing, but let's say a 38 turn uh, secondary, and then uh, an equal number of uh, turns for the primary and two other secondaries. And a lot of people have been throw, getting thrown off by that because basically you're doing these, you know, three windings, uh, the main winding, and then the, the two other, three other windings opposing it. So about 180 degrees for the, for the large winding and then the small ones, which are between three to five windings, uh, depending on the band you're on. And people are basically just getting thrown off by the fact that you've now got eight wires to deal with, keeping track of them. So one guy has suggested uh, for his largest winding, uh, to, to basically wind that, put it in, uh, solder it in, sort of hold everything, and then basically poke the wires to the bottom and wind them up and around. It's only three to five windings for those three other small ones. Through it, around the toroid, back down again. So may try that, may not. I'm a little bit less uh, scared of that, having won a few, done a few toroids in my time, but we'll see what happens. But uh, even 38 windings, uh, we're only covering half of the uh, toroid. 180 degrees is not that much, so we'll see what happens. But, uh, you know, people are mixing things up. And even I misinterpreted it the first time around, just reading it and reading it and reading it. And I think a lot of these things, the instructions is to read, 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 uh, and then read again and then go away and read some more. And just one other thing on the uh, new components, uh, even people are always contributing on these things. So one of the uh, caps that uh, were... Uh, there was two electrolytics replaced by uh, smaller ones. Uh, some guy had come forward and said, look, this is an, aud an audio chain thing. Uh, use polyester caps. Uh, and so I'm going to try to do that on the other one just because they sort of treat audio uh, much nicer. So there we go. That's the report from here. Well, that's great. Uh, thanks very much, Brian. <clears throat> when you mentioned the thump on the uh, transition there, it kind of reminded me of Frank and I in the way, way back when we built uh, the Firefly. And uh, Frank came up with a, a nice little uh, mod for that one to get rid of the thump. But it's been years since I've operated that rig. Actually, I probably only got it on the air once or twice and kind of forgot about it. So that kind of reminds me, maybe I should try something there. Uh, Al, you had a question? Yeah, just a remark. Uh, I built a QCX uh, 17 over the winter uh, when I was in Arizona. And uh, I got it. I, I, I'd done everything except uh, check the power output. But... Uh, I previously built one, and uh, this set of instructions said that some people like to uh, wind T1 and install it on the board first, in other words, out of sequence of the instructions. And that was really sort of very, at the very front of the instructions. And that's what I did, and it was infinitely easier than the previous time when I did it, when uh, the, the board was crowded and you had a little more trouble making sure that you were had the right wire in the right hole and that sort of thing. So uh, anyway, that was a good idea. But I haven't heard of the idea of uh, just sticking the uh, wires up through the uh, board and winding it uh, once the uh, main winding is is in. That's a that's a good idea too. But at the very least, I would say uh, you know don't wait until the proper step in the instructions before installing it in the board. You know, do it early. <laughs> Okay, that's good. Uh, that's good to know. Uh, sometimes one of those things are pretty tricky, and then uh, when you follow the instructions and uh, <laughs> it doesn't go so well, and then somebody finds a much better way. Oh, that's good. Uh, Kevin, you had a comment? Yeah, no, I just, I mean, we're talking about this, but no, I don't know if anybody's seen it, but they're, the coil they're talking about is this one right here. So there's a lot of windings and not a lot of room. So that's why. It's such a big deal. And this is the 40 meter version. I, I think the 80 is a lot worse. So anyway, just to put a picture to uh, the words, that's all. I forgot that you had a QCX. Yeah, now I just need the uh, CW part. <laughs> uh, well, you don't have to say it. Don't go. I know. I, I definitely was going to bring it up. <laughs> okay. How's your CW coming along? It's coming along. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Ken, you got a comment? In quality. <laughs> Go ahead, Ken. So, what was the uh, uh, what was the recommended 
winding procedure for that? Uh, basically, what he was saying was, so uh, take the 40-meter one, which Kevin was just showing. So it's, I think it, if I remember correctly, it's 38 wires. So basically cover um, 38 turns on about 180 degrees of it. And then put those in the holes, mount it. Um, some people would say solder it in. Some people would say not, but that's your choice, really. Then since you've only basically covered half of it locked to the board, you should have enough flexibility to be able to lift it up. Push the wires through in turn for the primary, which is five turns for the 40 meter, and the other two secondaries, which are also five turns, through the holes, around and about, and then back in the hole. So with using tweezers and only being three to five turns, uh, shouldn't be a major issue to do. The, the major issue, I think, and again, is that one has to observe phasing. So if no matter which way you're doing it, if you're coming up and around, or around the other side and around, make sure the turns are turning the same way on all the windings. So uh, some people had you know, done it one way on one and then another way and another, another way and another. It doesn't matter because where the wires end up is what establishes the phasing. So that, that was basically it. So um, the, the windings are out of phase to each other? Well, they would be out of phase. Uh, so like, for instance, if you say, okay, say for instance, if you start on the outside of the core, so go around and then around and around and around and then back around. If you start on the inside of the core, then you'd be going in the opposite direction, right? Okay. So just make sure it doesn't matter which way you do it. It's just you can preserve phasing. You have to preserve the same roundabout because otherwise the wires would end up in the natural position, you know, where they're supposed to land out of phase. If you started one on the outside of the toroid, and another one on the inside of the toroid because because these are all odd numbers and you know, the, the natural landing place for the mounting hole is on the outside of the toroid and also on the inside of the toroid where the wires obviously start and stop and start okay just one last question what's the output power on the qcx uh mine runs about five watts okay uh, the, one, the one that i bought used already built runs five watts so with it should run that okay as long as you you may have to go in and you know tweak the L, the low pass filter windings a little bit in and out. Some people say they may have to dismount it and add a winding or take a winding off. I I'm not a big fan of that. I've had to do it in the past, uh, and I just you know, but it is what it is. So I found like with the NorCal 40 and other rigs that I built, the NorCal stuff, the uh, small wonder stuff, uh, small wonder lab stuff. I got just as decent results just by basically spreading or tightening windings on the transformers of various types. Okay, cool. And then one other thing, I, sorry, Ken was saying there, so I don't know how many mods he did and stuff like that, but, you know, in keeping with uh, Hans is continuing on this thing, he has changed a few resistors and stuff like that and improved the keying waveform. So, yeah, you know, it's nice to stay. He's still staying on top of something that would be, you know, pushing four years old soon. Yeah, you're so right to watch that facing. I've been tripped up by that more than once. And the last go around with uh, that sort of thing, I spent a lot of time making sure I got it all right, and I still managed to get it wrong. You, and you end up going down the garden path a little a little bit because <clears throat> you think it's right, so you look elsewhere. Okay, uh, Al, you had another comment? Uh, yeah, uh, I'll just show you uh photo here oops actually i think dave has uh, has his hand up as well let's go to dave and then i'll uh i, I have a photo of the uh, t1 inside the rig uh, and uh, also there's a, a very very nice illustration on how to uh do the winding which i'll uh, i'll find again i had it there but i lost it okay uh, I know Ken had his hand up again. I didn't see Dave, but uh... no, I just had a quick question. I, I've been typing into the uh, chat box. Has everybody been able to see that? Yeah. Okay. Okay. I just wanted to make sure.
Well, you had it there for a second, though. Yeah. Really yeah, tough. that's that's a much less busy transformer than Kevin's. Uh, Kevin's transformer was almost picture perfect, wasn't it? See, everybody see that? Not now. Okay. <laughs> a little bit mysterious. Obviously, I should practice this more offline. Is that visible? No? No. Okay. I, okay, I'll give up at this point. I okay. don't want to hog the time. All right, Dave, uh, go ahead. Good evening. Can't hear you, Dave. Your mic's muted. You're acknowledging me finally? It's the first time. Quit complaining, or I'll kick you out. I got the little function here that says kick him out. I was just about to text Eric to say WTF. <laughs> no, I had a question about Al, the schematic Al put up about the uh, the phaser. Okay. How does it – it's obviously doing sideband. How is it canceling the sideband, the other sideband? If it's an upper sideband, how is it canceling the, the lower sideband? You're asking the wrong guy, but it's apparently uh, that's why it's called a phaser. It's uh, using phasing to suppress the other sideband, but uh, that I'm just mouthing the words without understanding them. You like that answer, Dave? No. <laughs> I have to say I don't like it either. <laughs> <laughs> There's some homework there then, Al. <laughs> yeah. Any other comments? Uh, okay, great. Okay, I thought we'd do a, a round table and I, everybody, I can I can probably, maybe the best way I can start and just go off the top and go around as I see everybody on the screen, maybe for a little comment, if you'd like to make a comment or a pass or just say hi or whatever. And how's that sound for everybody? Sound good? Okay. Well, guess what, Kevin? Yeah, you're first up. What do you got going on the bench today? Don't forget to unmute. Yeah, I just yeah, I just saw that. Um, well, you know what I've got because you challenged me with some software the other day. <laughs> so there's a new version of the SigGen software. Um, well, I don't know if you can't see the menu, can you? Does that make it any better? There we go. Oh, perfect. Okay, so you can see the menu right now. I got to do this backwards, and anyway, so. I know, Peter, you started this, right? Because you wanted to put an attenuator on this in association with uh, the SigGen. And I had bought a couple of boards as well, but never got around to doing the software because I just wanted to add it into Dave's, you know, routines. So anyway, we got, um, uh, I got to go here. So I hacked into your routines, Dave, and now, now there's a, a, another uh, menu on here for uh, attenuator settings which you can go through and then you can dial up, you know, how many dB you want attenuated. And the control lines come out on the bottom here. So it goes, it operates the 4302 attenuator chip in the parallel mode. And then these, so these control your dB attenuation. And, uh, and the dBm reading there is a nod to Peter. That's his homework. He's got an 8307 chip that he wants to, Read the value in and just add that in there, so you can read how much you're actually how much power you're getting after the attenuator. So anyway, that that's done and working. Although I haven't hooked the actual boards up yet to check, but all the signals are coming out right, so I don't see why it shouldn't shouldn't work. So anyway, that's uh, that's this week, and uh, I know Peter's uh, racing right along to add the uh, power reading to that as well. So anyway, that's my part. Well, you remember that. Uh story about the rabbit the hare and the snail oh yeah i yeah, guess who the snail is on this one. Oh, okay anyway, well. That, well i finally got it to accept everything i was doing the to get in the to the rf reading stuff and uh but that was late late this afternoon so uh i'm looking forward to tomorrow where i can actually get some progress there so that's great well good explanation uh there kevin thanks very much for all that and uh Eric, uh, VE, what is it? 
Yeah, yeah. Um, just remember, guys, uh, the, um, Dave brought up uh, last week uh, some of the shortcuts on the keyboard. Uh, you know, your space bar is your push to talk, and uh, M uh, uh, toggles between mute and unmute, so basically like a PTT uh, lock. So, uh, you know, use that. Uh, I'm using the push to talk right now, and uh, works fast and works fine. So, uh, so there we go. Um, uh, action. Am I, can you hear me? Everybody hear me? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Um, I guess, Al, is that you sharing your desktop? Uh, everybody yeah, else? I finally found out how to uh, sh show the T1 picture, but I didn't want to intrude. But yeah, if, you uh, want to if you're in gallery view, you can see it. Yeah, yeah, if you want to do it while well, you got it up there. Okay. Everybody see that now? Yep. Yep, we got okay, it. Okay, so that's the little bugger. Uh, I actually, uh, after I built it, uh, it was the uh, year that Hans was at uh, uh, FDIM. And uh, I said to him, you know, I think it took me six hours to install this thing. <laughs> and he looked at me <laughs> and I said, yeah, well, I mean, I had to make sure it was right. And it was a real bugger to put in. Now, well, here's a little picture uh anyway, it's sideways but anyway there's a a process here of how to wind the stupid thing i mean you you put a certain number of windings and then you have a great big loop and then some more windings another loop another winding some more another loop and then you end up cutting and you end up with the thing uh, properly wound anyway uh, probably too much information but it's a it's a it's such a neat little thing to build that uh I thought I'd uh, show it. Al, what are those little dashed lines? What do they represent uh, between some of the uh, uh, the wires? They represent um, they represent the um, the loop. You see, so I, it, it, like instead of doing tight winds, like here, for example, I don't know if you can see my cursor. Instead of doing tight winds, you have a great big loop out before you continue with the next wind, and then another big loop. And so you end up with uh, the whole thing wound uh, uh, in the same uh, direction. And then after you have the right number of winds, which is the sum of the main winding plus the, th the three secondary windings, or the, then you end up cutting the big loops and you end up with uh, you can see the numbers on the uh, ends of the wires here. And those are the ones you have to feed into the right holes, which uh, is what uh, took me so long. But as I said earlier, it was easier to do if you did it uh, first before you put anything else in the board. But anyway, just thought you might be interested in that. Well, that's great. Thank you, Al. How about, uh, so what have you got in your bench then, uh, Eric? Um, oh, have your bench up yet? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The bench is, uh, bench is just fine. Uh, Dave was over uh, helping me put the finishing touches on it last weekend. He'll uh, talk about that a little bit later. Uh, uh, but anyway, yeah, look at the, the, the jaw dropping. I like it. I like it. Um, shack? So, <laughs> yeah, the shack is fine. I'm just, uh, you know, sweat the mice out, uh, the rats. Uh, the, the, the rats the size of cats, but uh, okay. So I think last time we were in a meeting, uh, um, Kevin was uh, mentioning the uh, Bench Duino uh, board that the uh, guys over at Ham Radio Deluxe, uh, Ham Radio Workbench, sorry, Ham Radio Workbench uh, were uh, uh, flogging at uh, uh, Dayton last year and uh, I think still a current project. So uh, I am going to see if this works here um so there it is that is the um bench do we know motherboard i mean this is all available on their website obviously to see but uh that's it they're totally unpopulated uh, of course but um uh they also have a prototyping uh expansion board uh available it's got serial support on it as well sorry it's maybe a little close um and they have a bunch of Post adapters uh, as well. Uh, one for a PIC, uh, one for a Pi Zero or uh, Zero W, um, 
2560 Arduino host adapter. So uh, it's kind of neat. And uh, it also has a header socket if you have uh, Digilance Analog Discovery 2 um, uh, platform uh, that'll connect into that. That's another favorite of theirs. So um, anyway, neat product. They have, I think, all of the um, boards are available and populated uh, for about $50 or so. They seem to be uh, uh, reaching at that. that. I'm not sure if that includes the, uh, uh, the, the um, you know, the, all the components. I don't think so, though. But um, anyway, uh, a neat uh, platform. Apparently, I just saw a post that they are uh, using this, uh, I think, in conjunction with the University of Florida to test valves uh, for uh, ventilator uh, devices. So that's uh, one application that, uh, you know, they uh, prototyped on the board and are currently using. So um, that's a little current piece of info related to that. Um, uh, beyond that, uh, not a whole lot going on. Just uh, doing a little bit of shortwave listening and, uh, you know, whatever. Uh, busy uh, counting pills at the pharmacy for all those people out there. Thanks very much for that, uh, Eric. Uh, yeah. Very good. Okay, uh, I'm not sure if next up is Chris, but I ha I think he's gone or the signal's lost. Chris, are you there? Sort of. I'm I'm here and extra. Um, I lost my connection, and then when I logged back in, there's two of me now. <laughs> oh, yeah. Don't ask me how it. Uh, I mean, the first one, the one where it says connection lost. Feel free to kick that out because uh, I don't know how that's still there because I'm like like I said I. I my computer locked up. I had to restart, and uh, then I was there twice. Okay, I see you now at the bottom there. Okay, yeah. Chris, I, I kicked your altar. You go out. <laughs> that works for me. Okay, go ahead, Chris. How are you today? Okay, uh, I'm good, thanks. Um, this is actually, you guys don't know me. This is my first time here. <laughs> uh, back in my brain as to who you were. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, completely understandable. I, uh, I saw you guys on Facebook, and then when I saw that you guys were having an online thing, I was like, okay, well, um, so I'm completely new to amateur radio. I have a background in electronics and software development, but uh, RF and radio is like this big black hole in my knowledge. I know next to nothing about it. <laughs> well, well, you've come to the right spot. You want to yeah, join the club. <laughs> learn more. Sure, there's a lot of us that are like that, and <laughs> and uh, and what have you. But we all all learn and relearn and relearn. Uh, together, Chris. So have you got your license yet, your amateur license, or are you working on that? No, that I don't even know what that is. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, so what did you call it? It's a what license? Amateur radio license. Amateur radio license, okay. Yeah, maybe the best thing to do really would is, to, I guess, to Google uh, amateur radio license. And our club does hold uh, uh, class, classes for to you obtain your license, but I guess you'll have to wait. I'm not sure when the next one's going to be. Obviously, it's going to be a while yet. <laughs> yes. But uh, – but on the main uh, club website, uh, they will make announcements there. So it, keep coming in uh, uh, when we have these events. And, uh, and if I do get a, uh, a date when they may starting up, then we'll probably know, uh, know then, uh, uh, Chris, when that's going to happen. Okay, great. Any, uh, any idea of stuff I should try to learn before then so that I'll be ready? Probably well. I don't. I, let me go over to Ken. He might have some comment to make on that one there. Uh, Ken, do you want to take over there? Yeah, Chris. Um, go into go on your browser and type in a org. They've got everything there to know what amateur radio is about. Oh, awesome! Um, they're a big association in the states. They're. Uh, our rack is pretty much like their uh, ARRL. Um, they look after the rights of the ham operators, and they provide education material. Um, if you're serious into getting into amateur radio, I would buy a membership into them. And uh, I think it's 60 U.S. a year, and that includes the uh, printed version of a magazine that comes out every month. Okay. Um, okay, and Al, you have a comment as well? Yeah, I'm just going to ask if uh, are you a member of the um, 
Park Homebrew uh, group on uh, groups.io. Because if you are, we can post some stuff for you to look at, uh, pointers of where to go and look for information. That's no? a good idea. I'm not, but I can definitely uh, look into that. It was, sorry, it was what on groups.io? It's Park Homebrew. If you go on the club website. Yeah. If you go on the club website, there's a link to it. Uh, oh, perfect. Do you go to the club website or was it Facebook you were saying? Facebook. Facebook. Yeah, the club website is at, uh, oh, what is it? P uh, P O P E E L A R C dot org. And okay. under that will be uh, ho uh, the homebrew section. And in there, there'll be a link to the uh, our groups IO. Uh, go to that and then uh, uh, request to join, and then we'll uh, we'll approve you there. Great. Okay, great. Thank well, thanks very much for uh, checking in tonight. <clears throat> Thank you. Okay. Michael, good evening. How are you tonight? Yeah, pretty good. Uh, can you hear me? A little bit low, but we can hear you. Yeah, can you hear me now? Yeah. Um, I just wanted to say uh, I've been um, – the club, the Mississauga Club, bought a Flex 6600 to replace one of the FT uh, uh, – 12, um, one of the FT2000s. And uh, – <clears throat> The 6600 has the feature that you can uh, remotely control the antennas. Uh, uh, we've got a bunch of antennas at the club station. And uh, what I've been doing is in the last little while, I, I built a, uh, well, somebody uh, bought a, a USB relay. It's got eight, it's got eight uh, relays on it and you can control eight different antennas and you can connect it to the flex and a USB connection, and uh, it changes the antennas. It changes from one antenna to another automatically. So what I did, I put it in a box, and uh, I, don't, I don't know if you can see it. Can you see that? Can Can you see it? Yeah, we can see it. Hold it up a little bit higher. Yeah. Okay. There we go. Now we can is see. It, is it the Is it the right way round? Yes. Okay, because it's not when I look at it. <laughs> anyway, inside inside is a small. I I haven't I I don't want to fool around taking time to try to show you pictures, but inside there's a there's a small USB board of about about that size, and uh, basically all I've done is is taken that board and wired it to uh, <clears throat> a nine conductor cable that goes to the uh, relay the antenna switches at the station, and it's just the LEDs show which which positions on which position is connected by the radio itself. This is kind of a neat project anyway. So that's what I've been doing for the last little while. Well, that's great. Uh, I'm glad you showed it off to us there. Thanks very uh, much, uh, Michael. And Al, A.L.H., how are you tonight? Good evening. There we go. Can you hear me? Yep. Okay, yeah. <clears throat> well, oh, I've got a couple things. Um, I'm always going to be a little different. Anyhow, uh, actually, I want to make sure I can see myself there. There we go. Decided to uh, work on a direct conversion receiver, but trying to be different different than everyone else, I decided to go with vacuum tubes. Anyhow, um, I have to thank uh, Frank. Well, I don't know, a couple months back, Frank uh, had a subscription. I don't know if you can see this. To Frat well, Magazine. Frat, yeah. Yeah, so I subscribed, and uh, uh, what caught my attention was a, a nice article there on a low-power direct conversion receiver. Runs on 12 volts. Uses uh, vacuum tubes from uh, portable radios. So I'm uh, slowly piecing this thing together, scrounging parts. I've uh, got most of the hardware done now. Uh, so now it's time to get into the circuitry. I've done the audio amp which is a discrete transistor uh, audio amp. But you can see I have a lot of point-to-point -point wiring to do. But uh, a lot of the, uh, the hard chassis work is, is done now. So uh, who knows whether it's going to work. I may be looking for help. <laughs> well, I'm sure you won't have any trouble finding the help, Al. That's great to see. I know we contemplated a two project several years ago and never got around to it. So I look forward to our first, uh, when we get back to... Uh, uh, in-person meetings and bringing it out and we can have a, a real good close look at it. Simon's going to be your best friend, I think. I hope so. 
this is kind of uh, goes hand in hand. Uh, about five years ago, I built a vacuum tube novice special transmitter. Uh, came out of the 1971 ARL handbook, which is something that when I was a young teenager, uh, I was really interested in. And then you fast forward 40 years later, I pulled out the old magazine or the handbook and uh, flipping through, and I suddenly realized that I had most parts of my junk box. I could finally make it. So uh, I made that. It works. A little chirpy, but uh, so now we need a receiver to go hand in hand and uh, build up a total uh, novice station. Well, that looks really cool. Well, thanks very much for showing that off. Uh, that looks really nice, and they, they, I'm sure the pictures here don't do it justice on here as to the your uh, workmanship on that uh, chassis and stuff like that. Another good guy who would uh, get along with well, there would be Bill Mara. He likes that uh, that stuff as well, you know, from solder solder smoke thing. <laughs> well, okay. I got to admit, I'm a more mechanical than electrical. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Okay. Uh, Cos, how are you tonight? Good evening. Good evening, gentlemen. Am I coming through okay? Yes, you are. Okay, thank you. I'm doing okay. Can't complain. Just sitting here listening to all you uh, technical wizards babbling about and trying to pick up some words. I think I picked up a word that was Arduino. I think I've got to figure out what that means. <laughs> but other than that, I'm okay. Okay, well, well, thanks for uh, coming in tonight. Uh, We'll have to get uh, when we get all get back together and bring along, and I can and get out to a build-a-thon and whatnot, and start building uh, some projects. Well, I'm waiting for my phaser to come, which is supposed to be shipped on the 18th of May. So when that comes in, I'll uh, I'll be working on that. I've got uh, I think I got one of Dave's old power supplies that he gave me a couple of months back, and I'm just uh, trying to figure out how to convert that to a bench power supply to uh, to start populating my. Uh, bare bones ham shack which i just got the table constructed uh, last night so i'll be able to put some gear on that and work on that as soon as i get an antenna from uh park i'll be able to set that up and be able to talk to the world well there you go well, that's great oh well, that's good news there's some progress there okay well thanks very much uh Klaus, for uh, checking in and frank how goes it Get my mic on there, and I can let you know. <laughs> anyway, um, I haven't done too much on the bench. Uh, other things seem to have uh, taken over a lot of my time instead of ham radio. But um, I did some work on the uh, DC uh, receiver that we'll be um, using for the build-a-thon when it ever happens. And... Um, Got everything working on that. I uh, had a little problem with a, uh, uh, a VFO on it, and I borrowed uh, Ken's VFO, plugged it in, and it worked like a charm. So um, the board that uh, Kelly had uh, built for me had a very, very small short in it, one of those at the bottom of the grooves that, uh, that are cut with the laser, and I've had that before. But if you get a real good microscope, you can uh, cl clean it out. And as soon as I did that, then, then it took off and started working. Um, Ken had mentioned about uh, drifting on it. And yes, it does uh, drift as a uh, LC circuit uh, would do. But uh, once it settles down after 20 minutes or so, and you don't uh, wave the uh, or uh, turn a fan on or anything like that and get some air movement around it. Uh, it pretty well stays there. And uh, I was able to um, copy single sideband uh, signals as well as the uh, CW signals, um, you know, uh, without any drift. And that's after 20 minutes. If, uh, if you hold your breath and, and don't, don't let anything <laughs> bother it. Of course, if you put your hand near it, the thing uh, will will drift a bit. Uh, Ken uh, will probably talk about uh, something we've uh, been discussing on the um, direct conversion receiver uh, VFO, but I'll leave leave that to to him. Talking about uh, direct conversion receivers, Al, I'm very impressed with the uh, tube one, and uh, glad you were able to. Uh, 
to use the uh, the circuit in Sprat. So that that's worked out very well. Um, other news around here is my um, Windows 7 machine completely crashed with the blue screen of death. So uh, I'm talking to you on a tablet right now, which isn't quite as convenient, but it seems to be working. Yeah. And I'm not too sure whether to go to uh, Linux or maybe, I don't know, to twist my arm and I might even try Windows 10. But it'll mean, it'll mean a new, uh, new computer for Windows 10. That uh, uh, 7 machine just, just can't keep up. So that's about all that's happening um, in my shack. And uh, uh, back to you there, Peter. Okay, well, thanks for that update, uh, Frank. And I, yeah, my version of the direct conversion receiver, it took about 20 minutes to uh, to settle down as well. And I can't remember the differences between uh, yours and Ken and mine, but uh, regardless, it, it, it still had that healthy uh, burn in time. Uh, got a couple of comments coming up here. Uh, Dave, you're up first. Dave, you had something to say? Yeah, I can't remember. Oh, yeah, I wanted to ask uh, Klaus whether he got his bandsaw connected. Uh, is it receiving RF yet? No. Yeah, but I had to put a bigger blade on it, though. <laughs> Why, are you getting too much uh, noise? No, it's, it wasn't picking up any of the higher bands, just uh, was picking up the lower bands only. Nice, nice comeback. Nah, that's an auto toroid winder. <laughs> <laughs> Al, you had a comment? Yeah, I uh, just for Frank on Linux, uh, I just uh, in the last uh, month or so put on Linux Mint uh, dual boot on my uh, uh, older laptop, and I really like Mint, so if you're looking for a distribution, I recommend it. Um, I tried uh, a Linux Mint, but the uh, version that I had was uh, 14, and uh, everything was perfect. I loved it until it tried to connect to the internet, and there was a problem because it didn't have the security certificate. So, um, what is the current level of uh, Mint? Uh, I think it's eighteen or nineteen, uh, but it's. Uh, I had absolutely no trouble at all uh, connecting, and there's an even lighter version called Peppermint, which I have uh, on a on another machine which uh, uh, is, is very good too. But Mint is a little, has a little bit more features and uh, comes with more stuff installed. And, but it's still very lightweight compared to Windows. Quite like it. Yeah, I, I liked it uh, other than the fact I couldn't uh, connect to the Internet. Mind you, I was able to download all my mail, and it uses Thunderbird just like I do. And the other programs that I use are, are in there. So I was quite pleased. Uh, were you able to just down, download uh, Mint from the website? Yeah, I can post something on the groups.io, which one I, I downloaded. But yeah, if you, uh, if you Google Mint, it'll take you to the, uh, to the latest one. And it was fairly easy to install. I installed it from a USB stick. I don't know if you've been through that process, but you can download it and then uh, create an installation uh, medium on the uh, USB stick and then do a do an install that uh, worked out very well for me well thank you for that and i'll look forward to the uh, uh posting and uh, that'll be my next move before i uh <laughs> reluctantly go back into windows <laughs> there's uh there's also a bunch of it's a very common uh, uh linux i think people usually suggest it as like the first linux to try Yes, I've, I've used uh, Ubuntu a, f a few years ago, but uh, um, not, not recently. So yeah. um, I, I kind of like this Mint because of the applications that go with it. Actually, Mint is uh, a branch of Ubuntu. So Ubuntu is sort of the base, and then uh, Mint is built on top of it, has sort of a nicer appearance, and uh, it's, it's a little bit of a branch. But anyway, yes, it's based on Ubuntu, and so anytime you see something saying, here's how you install X or Y on Ubuntu, it applies to Mint. Okay, good. Well, that's another subject too, isn't it? Uh, another lengthy one there. Dave, you had a comment? Dave, you wanted to say something? Yeah, switching, switching screens here is terrible. 
I just wanted to show you guys something here. Let me see if I can get this to work. Can you see this? Yep. There is a Raspbian, Linux Raspbian distribution now, and it's Windows XP. They've, they've uh, created the look and feel to make it look like uh, XP. So it's, 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 uh, and if there's some videos uh, on YouTube that'll walk you through how it looks. So if you've got a Raspberry Pi 4, uh, this will run, and it's as if you've got uh, um, Windows XP. Does it make you feel like W is back in the White House, too? Yeah. <laughs> oh, shut up. Uh, that's pretty cool. Okay, thanks. Okay, Ken, what have you got to say for yourself? Oh, not much. Um, okay, moving on then. <laughs> uh, hey, hey, uh, Dave, lower your uh, you're on screen share still. Yeah, what's the shortcut? Is it S? Uh, click the icon again. Yeah, left icon on the bottom. But there should be a keyboard. Uh, it says uh, yeah, yeah, it's S. Yeah, I did do that. Let's see. I'm hitting S. I'll just hit the. Try try D. Try D. Delta. There. Okay. Yep, that's it. Okay, Ken, go ahead. Yeah. So uh, when when did we have the uh, SIGGEN uh, build-a-thon? How long ago was it? Uh, two falls back. <laughs> yeah. I, I just built it this past weekend. <laughs> Not quite done, but almost there. <laughs> so that's what I've been working on. Um, I should have it done this weekend. Um, the other thing I've been working on, and uh, Frank had mentioned it, is our uh, uh, our uh, DCR design. And uh, I don't know if you've see, you guys have seen my um, uh, screen captures and videos on it. Um, I hate drift. I can't stand it. I don't care how long it drifts for. I hate it. So I was thinking about a possible uh, digital VFO. Now, I don't know if some of you guys remember, we used to have our um, meetings on George Street. And uh, there was an English uh, gentleman who worked for LTC. Yep. Yeah. And at one time, he used to bring in parts and everything all the time. And one of the things he brought in was a sample card from LTC and it was like a tiny little book and you open it up and they had like 12 digital oscillator sample chips to play with. And at the bottom, there was also prototyping boards that you could uh, uh, solder pins in and it, it would convert it to an eight pin dip package. So you could just plug it in. Um, I took a look at this and uh, let me see if I can bring up uh i'm going to do a screen share here uh screen share where is it there it is uh, it is where the heck is it windows d delta uh, toggles between screen sharing yeah, but it's not pulling up the image that I want. Uh, where the heck is? No, it doesn't show the image. Windows applications. Entire screen. Let me see if I can. There we go. Can you guys see the schematic? Yeah, no problem. Okay, so basically this is the, the latest version. And uh, what we have here is the bandpass filter here. And uh, this one is for 40. This is the, the SA612 chip. Um, down here is another plug-in bandpass for 20. I haven't built that one yet to try it. Um, we have the... Uh, uh, audio coming out into LM386 and then off to a speaker. Uh, 
this app is pretty powerful for a small chip. It works quite well. Um, up here is the power supply. So what we're doing is um, feeding six volts to everything. Uh, it's running on the 612 and uh, it's uh, feeding. This is the VFO here. You can see the capacitor here, the, the, the toroid. Uh, we have a, a reverse bias diode to vary the capacitance on. And uh, we have uh, here is a band limit set uh, potentiometer. And over here is rough course tuning and fine tuning. This whole scheme here works very, very well, uh, except for the drift part. Um, and LC circuits naturally drift. Now, depending where you're using the receiver, um, if it's in, uh, in the house and it's the middle of summer and it's hot like hell and your AC is going full blast, that air moving through the room will change uh, the, uh, the circuitry, the frequency, especially the capacitor. Um, all I've got to do is take a straw, blow on this capacitor, and it, it'll take off like a rocket. Um, here's uh, another VFO, and that's for 20. I haven't tried it either. So the, the, the drift, I hate drift. I can't stand it whatsoever. So uh, this uh, LTC uh, sample card that we got from this uh, 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 Englishman at the old uh, meeting place handed out. And on one of the... Um, one of the, can you see this chip here? Yep. Yeah. Okay. On the sample card, he's got a, a number of different uh, digital oscillators. And they're controlled by this resistor here. Just like in our DCR where the resistor uh, varies the frequency. Well, this does too. And basically, uh, this chip has three frequency uh, ranges set by this switch. So if you ground it, it's one range. If you leave it open, it's another range. If you tie it high, it's another range. This whole chip here can replace our LC, um, LC circuit in the DCR. And uh, we could still have the band limit uh, uh, resistor and the coarse tune and the fine tune. Um, the, the only problem is, is the physical size of the chip is you can barely see it. It is so small. Um, I have this sample card, so I'm uh, sometime in the very near future, I'm going to try and do my own dip uh, prototype board for eight pins and uh, change the circuitry or build another one to try and use this chip. Um, the, uh, the drift on this is so small, it's, it's negligible. And, uh, this might be, by the time we add up all the parts for the LC VFO, this will probably even be cheaper. You got to buy toroids, you got to have wires, you got to have capacitors, you got to have resistors. This one here has one chip, uh, a capacitor. And then this, this sample has got one re variable resistor. Ours will have three. It'll be the same, basically the same uh, variable pots that we'll use on the LC version. So I am really interested in trying this one out. It's too bad the, uh, there's two prototyping uh, boards. Uh, they're probably about uh, an inch wide by three quarters of an inch high. Um, but unfortunately, they have um, uh, uh, other chips on there for uh, high frequency, and you can't swap the chips. So I'm also looking. I think DigiKey carries the development board for this chip. So I'm going to take a look and see if it's uh, feasible to spend the money on it or just try and figure out my own little prototyping board. So that's, that's where I am, and that's where uh, Frank is.
with the DCR. But other than that, it works like a charm. The DCR is so nice. Um, the bands have been really bad, uh, except for the CW. Uh, the CW is really good. I've heard a couple of voice contacts, and it, it works really well on, on uh, side band. The only thing you got to get used to, because it's direct conversion uh, receiver, uh, you're going to hear, if you tune on either side of the carrier, you're going to hear both side bands. And that's, that's what's on my table. Well, that's pretty cool. Uh, you know, it's just it, just the other week I was thinking about that uh, that sample that sample uh, card that he gave us, and I've been looking uh, all over the shack for it, and uh, and I can't find it because you're right. There's some interesting stuff that's in in there, Ken. And another thing too is uh, with LT Spice, you know that chip's probably uh, in the library for LT Spice, so you could go ahead and. Uh, Spice that uh, you know, do a, a spice simulation on the uh, direct conversion receiver with that in there would might be an interesting thing to try, Ken. Yeah, I think they do have the uh, LT Spice uh, um, um, uh, formulas that you can download from them somewhere okay. on their site. Okay, that's good. Okay, um, thank you. All right, Dave, what's new? You got a new shack yet? Are you talking to me? Well, thanks for yeah. that. Dave. Okay, do, on. I, do I amuse you? <laughs> Joe, Joe Pesci go, do I amuse you? Do you think I'm funny? <laughs> no, I haven't done anything radio uh, whatsoever. I was just looking at that uh, uh, schematic that uh, of the, or the data sheet for that LTC 6900. It's actually for a little chip that big. It's got pretty good out, output it's almost uh it's almost rail to uh to the positive rail and it's uh 300 microamps coming out of that little sucker so it's actually pretty good but no what i've been doing is working and uh This is what I've been working on. This is a uh, program I've been writing. It's got, uh, it's in JavaScript. It's using JSON. This is the back end. There's 13, almost uh, 20,000 lines of code. That's one, that's the back end. And here's the, where's the front end? Can you guys see this? Mm -hmm. Yep. The front end, it's got uh, probably another 20,000 lines of code. JavaScript, just JavaScript alone, it's got 4,000 lines of code. JSON, it's got about uh, 13,000 lines of code in the front end browser. So that's what's been keeping me busy these days, is I'm writing a uh, client server, a web application, and it's uh, it's basically an API back end, but uh, nothing to do with... Uh, radio whatsoever okay well that would definitely put me to sleep dave sorry what's that so that would definitely put me to sleep yeah. <laughs> i wouldn't even okay so you beat the lines of code that's in the sna <laughs> yeah and i've been working on this now for almost a year uh, I bet you you're itching to get back into some ham radio uh, code. <laughs> uh, as soon as this COVID thing goes away and I'm able to sell my house and get a new shack, yep, yeah, can't wait. Eric was over. Eric was over the other day. He defied the social distancing <laughs> rules. He had to come by and see me. <laughs> well, I guess if he had some Jamesons to clean things up, I guess it'd be okay. And Eric wanted to make a quick comment, right, Eric? Uh, yeah, actually, it's uh, something I just want to try here, a proof of concept, uh, something I don't think we've done on any of our meetings before. Uh, I'd like to see what Share a YouTube video actually does. So if you guys are willing to put up with a less than 60-second uh, video, I think you would uh, all be amused by this. Uh, it's uh, basically a crew working on a 15-kilowatt AM uh, 
tower um, and they're doing maintenance. So they got to de-energize uh, the antenna. Um, and uh, it's kind of interesting what happens when they uh, disconnect the jumper. Uh, uh, you know, they, they basically have a, uh, uh, you know, a little bit of uh, magic happening between the clamp and the antenna feed. So uh, uh, let's see if this works, uh, if you guys can bear with me. Uh, dee, dee, dee. Okay, here we go. AM tower, 50 kilowatt tower. And basically what it is, is the tower itself is the, uh, the, the whole underground is the dish and the tower itself is the feed horn. So when you remove these right here, it's basically electrical current that's running through these. So we're just going to take this one off right here. You do not ever touch the AM tower. That's right. Yikes. Unmute your mic, Garrick. There we go. Um, look out. Tower. Ah, stop that. Kilowatt tower. And this, uh, oh, my goodness. Uh, escape. I could see Eric. Try pressing D. D again? Yeah, no, that doesn't seem to be doing it. Uh, how do I? Oh, stop YouTube video. There you go. Remove. Ah, all right. I think we're out. Um, anyway, so that was all. Did everybody able to see that uh, just fine? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, that's good. So that means we can do that uh, if we want to at some point. Uh, but yeah, I thought that was kind of fun watching the uh, little plasma ball act as a speaker for the uh, uh, the AM programming there. So uh, anyway, that was it. Um, so, okay. Sorry. Um, no, no, that's all. Yeah, I'm good. I'm good. Move on. Okay, good. Yeah, we've got a couple more guys to uh, go through here. So uh, Ken, you got a question? Actually, a comment. We're going to have to uh, replace the statement, lick the capacitor with touch the tower. We got an email the other day about the uh, uh, working on the uh, using the, atten the attenuator along with the uh, the signal generator got me thinking about going and uh, modifying my uh, uh, signal generator. Uh, I forget who uh, who We're demonstrated that. Out. If Chris is still online, if he will give me his email address, I'll send him a package of information about getting uh, an amateur radio call sign. Yeah, Chris, you still there? Yep, I'm still here. Do you want me to just type it into the chat window? I have to unmute there, Marty. You okay with Chris putting it in the chat window, his, his uh, email? I don't have the chat window. I might be able to have it here. I'll, I'll tell you the setup here. I'm using a, a tablet, an iPad, hmm. and that's how I'm getting the, the meeting. So I have to touch the screen uh, for that now. Let's see. I don't have anything there, Chris. No? No, I just got Chris that. Thanks. 2043. You know, the chat window's down the lower left-hand side of your screen beside the raise your hand icon. Uh, Looks like a little speech bubble. I'm, as, I, as I said, I'm on an iPad, uh, so it's a bit different. Okay, well, well, Chris, if you want to just tell them your email address, if it isn't too complicated. Nope. Um... Okay, it's just C. Larson, and uh, Larson is L-A-R-S-E-N. Right. At techsavvy.com. T-E-C-H. T-E-K. T-E-K. Yep. S-A-V-Y. Uh, two Vs. 
S A V V Y. Yes. Dot com. Yep. Got it. I'll send you uh, some information that I. I, I'm from Ancaster here, Hamilton Amateur Radio Club, and uh, I've been teaching the, the uh, basic course, uh, and I, I'll send you a package of information I send out to uh, people who write in and ask about it. So. Oh, that's great. Thank you. You're welcome. That's it, uh, Peter. I haven't been doing anything on the bench, uh, but what I have been doing is getting my uh, Flex Radio and the ICOM 7300 working, and I've been doing uh, net control on... Uh, on the um, uh, ONTARS net occasionally and uh, uh, trying to do some CW. I've had a couple of good CW contacts with uh, slow guys uh, around uh, 7050, 7050 and the 40 meter band. There's a, a bunch of guys down in Florida. They call themselves the S C S. Uh, a Straight Key Century Club, SKCC Group. And they send about uh, maybe 10 or 12 words a minute. You don't have to use a straight key, but uh, you can get some good uh, uh, work uh, if you're just getting into CW uh, with those guys. 7050. Uh, that's it. Thank oh, that, oh, that's, that's great, Marty. Thank you and, uh, for the reminder for 7050. I did try to do some CW with some local guys here on some ground wave uh, a couple of weeks ago. And would you know, and we were also doing QRP. We were breaking out our home homebrew rigs to do this as well. And it was a heck of a challenge. We didn't really have a successful uh, QSO, although I finally did hear somebody, but there were so many, you can tell there's something going on. There was, there was no clear spot on the band. So a couple of Watts was pretty tough to pick out of the, out of the mess that was going on, but it was still fun nonetheless. Um, for me, uh, other than the signal generator project with the attenuator, uh, that's ongoing. Uh, another thing I've been playing around with is GNU radio. And, uh, the last uh, couple of, well, we started off with, uh, narrow band, wide band FM, uh, using the hack RF or a dongle. And the last couple of weeks, we, we've been having weekly sessions now for the GNU radio stuff. And, uh, we uh, did a, a whisper transmitter last week, although I didn't quite get that one going, but that was because of computer troubles. And uh, this past Monday, we did uh, a whisper receiver, and uh, it works really, really well. So GNU Radio controlling the uh, Hack RF, and then we just piped the audio through the virtual audio cables into uh, the whisper program, and uh, boom, was decoding the signals. It, it's, uh, it was pretty cool. So uh, that's a lot of fun too. Not quite uh, melting solder, but uh, still fun nonetheless. Okay, uh, that's everybody for the round table. Um, does there any, any more, uh, anybody have anything else to say, comments? I got a couple things. Sure, go Brian. ahead. Yeah, just uh, okay. So uh, the uh, for the Straight Key Century Club, I've been actually active with them since uh, last October. I started working to award their awards. So the the principal frequency is around seven o five five, but seven o five o and above there seven five five seven six o. If you use a straight key, then you can uh, start working towards their awards. So the first one is a hundred contacts for the straight key members. You exchange a number. You can apply to their website to get a number. They've had a lot of members joining since the pandemic uh, isolation started. And once you have 100, then you can go for their rewards. So I've got the 100, and then I'm up to the next 50, which is the Tribune. So anyway, if you look up their straight key CC uh, website, a lot of info there. They have a couple monthly things they do. They do a weekend sprint, and then they also do a two-hour sprint on Wednesday nights during the month. And just the other thing for Chris, uh, not to uh, denigrate uh, the work of uh, Marty and other people running the classes. If you get the uh, the study books, Chris, uh, there's a study guide and also a, a licensing uh, test guide. You can study at home and uh, you can take the test from a volunteer examiner through the club or something. So I know it might be a while before we see any live classes happening. So I did it as a winter project. Uh, to get the license guide and write the exam uh, that winter years ago. Uh, pandemic would be a perfect time probably as well just to get the license guide, study guide, and bone up. If you've got the theory a little bit behind you, you're way ahead because it's the, the math that seemed to trip a lot of people up. But anyway, there you go, 7-3. 
<laughs> Thank you. Okay, thanks uh, for that, Brian. Uh, one co another comment for me is uh, we did a, a schedule for the uh, Jitsi meets. Uh, we, we have two types of meetings, just to briefly go over them. Uh, one is this type here, and then we're going to have the third Wednesday of the month uh, type meeting where we hope to maybe have a presentation, a little bit more formal in that regard. And uh, then there's this type as well. So if you look at the at, at the club website, you'll see the uh, the link in there for the schedule. And uh, we have uh, we we're going to try and do every two weeks, but we wanted to keep the uh, the regular meeting in that same spot. So there'll be a couple of back to back spots, and this will be one of them. So next week uh, we'll have another one of these sessions on the sixth of May. And I put Eric down as the uh, moderator on that one. Sound you still good with that, Eric? Sure, yeah, that's fine. Uh, so it's May 6th, right? Uh, two weeks? Yeah. No, no, next week, next week. That's right. next week, yeah. Yeah, okay, sure. And then uh, two weeks after that on the 20th, then we'll have the uh, the regular club meeting, Jitsi. So uh, and there we go. So you can check out that. Uh, if somebody would like to take a, pos a, a position as a, as a controller or a moderator, let me know. Right now we have the 3rd of June open if somebody would like to take that spot. And uh, other than that, I think that's that's about it for me for now. So uh, we had 14 people uh, online tonight. That's uh, fantastic. Uh, thank you. I thank everybody for uh, participating. It was a very informative, interesting meeting. So I thank all. And uh, any last comments before we sign? Yes, sir. I'm not sure who that was, but go ahead. It's Ken. It's Ken. Oh, yeah. um, the uh, our classes won't be held until the end of next January, beginning of February. That's when they're usually run. Okay. Uh, Barry also here, uh, hire, uh, hires, ha carries classes as well. You can also check with them. Maybe they are uh, on a different schedule. I think actually their courses are uh, spanning over a longer period of time, whereas ours are done over two weekends. I don't think there's many clubs that uh, do the uh, two weekend things that we did. It was something we experimented with many, many years ago. It was so successful, we stuck with it. But I'm not aware of anybody else uh, fast tracking like that. But uh, okay, that's good to know, Ken. Thank you. Okay, yeah, Chris. I think, hey, I think Chris. you're right, actually. By the way, I did look at the Barry things not too long ago. I think it's like 10 or 12 weeks, three hours a week or something. It's quite a few more hours, like probably three times the number of hours by the time all is said and done. Well, I, I I think that the longer time would be more of a benefit because then you'll have more time to read ahead, get your questions together, and then bring them to the next uh, class. And one more thing. Uh, I was talking about that uh, LTC uh, sample card. I don't know if you guys can see it here. Uh, hang on. I'll switch over views. Okay, this is what the sample card looks like. Uh, on the back of it is uh, mini circuits of their uh, different chips. Uh, the different chips have different frequency ranges. When you open it up on the, uh, I'm trying to get it in the window here. On the uh, left side is a chart of the chips that are in the card and uh, short specs on them. And on the right side are the sample chips themselves. Um, the one I'm proposing to use is very, very small. I'm going to have to use a super microscope to solder that sucker in. But, uh, yeah, if this works, this might be uh, uh, a, better, a better source for a VFO. Okay, great. Well, I look forward to you soldering that. <laughs> Marty, go ahead. Yeah, I think the gentleman uh, you were talking about was John Barnes. Yes. Who's uh, Sid Lipkowitz's brother-in-law. Oh, I didn't know yeah, that. Yeah, and at the time, I think John, John was a linear technology rep for, I don't know if he's Canada or Eastern Canada, something like that. Anyway, he's around. I've Okay, I haven't talked to John for well years since Saint Saint uh, since uh, George Street. Well, he he, he was going to uh, Hamex, I think, as a uh, for 
couple of times as well, but they, but that's a long time ago. Anyway, yeah. uh, any other comments? Um, do we have any uh, um, guest speakers lined up? Because I know we had some things we were talking about before. Is that all gone out the window, or did we actually have anybody scheduled in any particular months? No, there's nobody scheduled in now. I think the idea being it kind of fell apart a little bit because, well, for obvious reasons. And now we're getting our feet wet with this. And uh, I guess when we get comfortable with this, and uh, that maybe we'll uh, we'll organize that. Yeah, because I think this is uh, reliable enough that we could uh, invite somebody on without uh, being too embarrassed about uh, quality or setup. Uh, maybe another few go rounds of it, and we'll uh, all look like pros. I think you're right. I was noticing. I was paying attention tonight because you know last night Ken and I did a little bit, and uh, the lag we had was uh, was quite severe. I blame it on my on my uh, young fellow because uh, he was home last night playing his games and he's at work tonight. So and <laughs> I think I've been in the green all night. But I, I will make a comment. Uh, there's been a few red signals. Actually, there's about four or five of them right now, and uh, and I haven't really seen that severe of a problem even though you may have had a, your signal strength may have been showing red. You know, even that computer whiz guy named Dave has been in the red all night as well. So I don't know what his problem is. Too many lines of code in this computer, I think. But anyway, so that's the good news. If we can have a successful meet and even with the signals in the red, that's a, that's a good sign. Yeah, no, I must say your, uh, your video quality is probably the best uh, out of uh, everybody that I've kind of surveyed through oh. here. Uh, uh, I don't know whether that's just your camera resolution or your, uh, I mean, you, you obviously have uh, a wired uh, connection to the internet. Uh, I uh, have yeah. to rely on cell tower uh, myself. So I generally, I think, don't get above, uh, you know, good. So uh, anyway. Yeah, I switched to a hard wire last week. Uh, and I actually switched to another computer as well. So anyway, well, that's good. Well, thanks, everybody. Again, like there was 14 of us tonight to check in. So this is Grant. So hopefully we'll see everybody next week. Yeah. Adios. Adios. All right. Thanks. thanks, Peter. See you next week. Ciao. Mm, bye for now. See you, Frank. Adi adios. <clears throat>